uh, David right here called me and he said, hey, I have a friend from South Africa whose son is going to be a student at ORU this fall, and that's the son right there, okay? All right, up a little higher, okay, all right? And who's going to be a student at ORU this fall, and I'm working to get him transportation because it's a family from South Africa, and he needs a car. So we worked together on that. We ended, I ended up not doing anything. Dave did all of it, but it was nice having the conversation. And so... So anyway, we worked on making sure Joel had a car. Well, Joel and his dad flew to Colorado Springs a week before school starts started so Joel could get oriented and have some people here in the United States that he knew. All right, so we spent some time together. We all got to know one another, and it was, it was great. And it turned out I had met his dad, what, 22 years ago or something? 30 years ago. Yeah, go ahead, say it. And so... <laughs> 30 years ago in South Africa, and so we talked about that, and, and I pretended like I remembered. It was great. And so, so I don't even remember being alive 30 years ago. Okay, so, so anyway, David says that. David and I went to college together, and we still think we're college kids some days, and it's really not good. And so, so anyway, uh, spent that week together. It was wonderful. Then Thanksgiving came up. And, well, then we decided as a church to send toothpaste money to Joel a couple times a month so he could just get the, the little things that he might need, you know, not enough to pay tuition or anything like that, just enough to be able to take a woman out if he wanted to or, or buy, buy uh, toiletries and things like that in college. All right, so we decided to do that. Then Joel came up here for Thanksgiving because his family was in South Africa. And so uh, joined us for the big meal we had here on Thanksgiving. And so I asked his dad if he would uh, speak to us this morning and teach us that chapter that is the subject this morning. All right. And the chapter this morning is Exodus 32. Now, his dad, as you can see, has ministered uh, in many countries all around the world. How many times have you been in South Korea alone? 92. Uh, 92 times in South Korea alone. And so he spends a lot of time encouraging the body of Christ around the world. And I think we're honored to have him here with our humble church here this morning. And so let's be a mighty majestic church and welcome our dear brother. Hey, yes. welcome, my friend. Love you. Ah. Thank you. Notes. Note, he had to pull me up the platform. He took me ATVing yesterday, and I thrashed them. I left and you them. what it? You what? I wiped out twice. You wiped out twice with very I'm, little bodily brother, injury. I'm preaching right now, please. And I, oh, you want me to leave? Okay. <laughs> that was code for set down. Well, I must say, though, I was relieved when you walked in, not on crutches this morning. Glory, After what I, I saw you do on that like, ATV. I was like a hippo in the tub last night, soaking. <laughs> I've got to get on to this. I've got to get on to this quickly. I'm married, 36 years, awesome wife. Sorry, Karen's not here. Three children. God has blessed me. I came out of a Christian family. It's really good to have Joel with me. I was, the devil tried to kill me when I was a baby with diphtheria, and I had six hours to live, and my parents dedicated me to the Lord. You asked me to ex share on Exodus 32. It's a truckload of information. And God relented in Exodus 32. God should have wiped me out because I, I did kneel down and I said, I don't want you. Turned around and I knelt down and I prayed to Lucifer to come into my heart. He should have wiped me out. But he relented because of the grace of God. But go back to family. Go back to mom and dad. Amazing parents. Brought me up in the house of the Lord. When I was seven years old, all by myself, God Gave my life to Jesus Christ in my bedroom. I had a vision of the judgment seat of Christ, and I was there. It was my turn. And I ran to mom, and I said, help. And she said, go back to the bedroom. You know what to do. And I went back to my bedroom by myself, gave my life to Jesus. If you don't understand me, you've got a problem. Because I understand myself. My son understands me. <laughs> uh, am I speaking too fast? Cool. 
Like every child, want to kick a ball, ride a skateboard, but there were no skateboards in those days. I'm 56 years old, um, nine years old. So we went to the national church camp, I came out of a full gospel denomination, Pentecostal church, speaking in tongues, you know, preach fire. And all the kids want to kick a ball and go swim in the river because it's a national church camp and we're all coming together. And I would wake up five o'clock every morning because I had a desire in my heart. I wanted God. And I would go and pray in the chapel and there would be the seminary students there which were ancient. They were like all 20 to 30 years old. And for some reason they turned to me and laid hands on me and the prophetic word that came was, you'll marry a beautiful woman, you'll have three children, one will have a deformality, God will heal, you'll have a double anointing with a physical sign, you'll preach the, will, you'll preach the word of God to kings and queens and travel the world. I got water baptized when I was 11. When I hit high school in 1976, I turned away from God. I got, I got, um, I graduated too soon. Basically, I got expelled from school. And <laughs> 1978, the Lord got me by the scruff of the neck. I was at a youth camp. I had five court cases against me, and I was at a youth camp. And my parents said, you will go to this youth camp, or you're getting out the house. For three years, I messed up my life. There's always going to be distractions in your life. And there were distractions in the camp of Israel. Just go read Exodus 32. And the distractions came from a group of people. And let me say this to you quickly. The power of association will pick you up or pull you down. If you sleep with dogs, you'll pick up fleas. Hang around pigs, you'll smell like a pig and you'll end up looking like one. Walk with the righteous and you grow righteous. That's what the word of the Lord says. And I hung around with pigs and I went into a pit hole and I was walking through the field. All the guys were watching, singing Kumbaya and, you know, that's not even in the Bible. And they were watching Ben-Hur and that's not in the Bible. So I went out to go and smoke marijuana. And it's like, all by myself in the middle of the field, I audibly heard the word of God. Marijuana Come out. Do that no, I hadn't smoked it yet. <laughs> Come out and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. Separate yourself from these things. And all by myself, 17 years old, I knelt down, gave my life back to Jesus Christ. 1978, September. Within a few months, I met the most glorious, beautiful 15-year-old. Went straight up to her and I said, will you marry me? And she said, wait for the legal age. <laughs> she turned 18, we got married. Our firstborn came, born deaf. And I rejoiced. I rejoiced. You know what the church is like? Don't want to go down that road because it was a wonderful church where it lit literally I saw people raised from the dead in that church. Literally I did. My dad raised a man from the dead. I saw it. Grandpa's still alive. It's my mom's birthday today. She's 85. But in that church, the pastor said to me, it's your daughter's deaf because of the sin in your life. And I said to my wife, we sit down, we don't move. I'll get to Exodus 32. Don't worry. She was born, well, a few years later, about 25 years later, she had the cochlear implant. But I want to come to that experience when I was nine years old. I want to tell you something. When I got hit by the power of the Holy Spirit, my life changed. The Holy Spirit's not going to come and put war makeup on you to make you look pretty. He's going to come to empower you to do works of service. I went to seminary, which was more like a cemetery, but it was good. It was a good place. I learned the Greek, I learned the Hebrew, and it's like I quit. Then I went back to seminary again. Well, I finished seminary the first time, and I went back a second time to seminary. And I had an experience of the presence of the Lord. And then it was, that's when I met you, 1989. And I received a prophetic word that... I'll speak to kings and queens again and all of this stuff and I'll travel the world. And I went like, Lord God, how will this happen? Because I'm not called to be a pastor. I'm not called to, to do the stuff 
the guys who graduate from seminary are called to do. I know I'm called to do one thing. Get your word, put it in my heart, and take it to the nations. Let pastors deal with elders and deacons and churches. I'm like, just, I want to do that. So my, I went to my wife and I said, honey, what do I do? And she's, I never, ever challenged my wife. Ted, never challenge Gail. Look who you married. I mean, like, hello. So I said to my wife, what do I do? And she said to me, shut up, sit down and pray. That took me four years. We well, literally four years. I fasted at least five, six times, 40 days on water. I came to the point where I wanted to die. There were so many distractions, golden calves in my life that the Lord needed to crush and burn. And I was invited to a meeting, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and I got touched by the presence of the Lord in this meeting. I got inebriated drunk for 15 days. I couldn't walk. My wife wouldn't let me sleep in bed with her because I was shaking uncontrollably. The presence of God was so heavy on me. My next week, I was in Mozambique. Within a month, I was in Russia. I've been to the US 36 times. I've had my hands on the throne of the Queen of England in the House of Lords, Prophecy and Times magazine. Look, I was in a meeting similar to this in South Korea, and I looked at a man and I said, stand up. And he stood up very smart with his wife, took oil and I poured it on their head, and I said, you will be the next president. He became the next president of the country. I looked at a woman in the meeting and I said, the Lord says you're gonna have a baby within one year. And she said, uh-uh. Uh uh, can't happen. I said, it's going to happen. She said, can't. I've had a hysterectomy. I've had 80% of my intestines removed. I said, God, have mercy, forgive me. I said, my dear, I'm so sorry. I'm not sorry because that's happened. I'm, I'm apologizing because I don't want to raise your hope. I'm just a man. I can mess up. Forgive me, please. And she said, I forgive you. It's okay. And I walked away feeling, and I came back a year later to preach in the same church, and she comes running up to me with the baby. And I said, what's this? She says, when you were speaking, there was movement. Well, my husband and I had a party afterwards, and <laughs> I wasn't feeling too good in the morning. And went to the doctor, and there was a new womb, and all her intestines had been replaced. We serve a living God. But I want to tell you why we don't see miracles in church. Because there's a golden calf in the house. And the Lord says, I'm not just coming to remove the golden calf in the house, but I want to remove the golden calf in your life. And I can say this to you daily, the word, the scripture that comes to me, where Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I come back and I say, Lord God, deal with this attitude of Mark Fisser. Come and lay this man down, Lord God, and crush that golden calf that I've established, that I've built up. And you know what? God looks at me and he says, my son, I relent from bringing judgment. I minister grace and mercy through Christ. And I bring my Holy Spirit to you as your counselor, comforter, and friend that will empower you with a different fire. Let's, we better use scripture. I'm supposed to use scripture when we preach. Let's look at that first one. Exodus 32, 20. He took the calf that they had made and burned it. Then he ground it into powder, threw it into the water, and forced the people to drink it. I like that. He burned it. Listen, you burn it with fire. Okay, and we need some burning to take place. This is not a Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost shakedown here. This is when you deal with the issues in your life and you burn the golden calf in your heart. You need to be the sheriff of your own soul here, my friends. You can't have Pastor Ted stand up here and preach a glorious message and think that that's going to deal with it. You've got to go home and work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Separate yourself wholly unto God. Touch not that unclean thing. Deal with it here. And the Lord says, as you do that, the process of sanctification, I will lift you up because you are justified. And I will cause miracles, signs, and wonders to happen through you. I want to tell you something. The promise of God in your life will come to pass. 
Don't, don't stress out. I know hope deferred makes the heart grow faint. That's what the word of the Lord says. But let's look at Philippians 1, 6 quickly, please. And I am certain that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. God have mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace and your promise to me. Let me tell you one thing that I know. The word of God, which is Yahweh, we know it's Jesus Christ. Am I, amen? amen? It's the Logos. You with me? Yeah. The Logos was sent to earth. But the Logos was sent to earth in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you cannot receive the message if you do not receive the messenger. You have to receive the messenger, and the messenger is the Holy Spirit. He is the carrier of the word of God. Now, the message, the word of the Lord will do three things for you. Three things. One, it will release your destiny to come to you. All of us, by default, through age process, are walking into our destiny. But I don't believe that's what it's supposed to be like. God didn't put eyes under your chin. He put them in front of you so that you can foresee, you can see. And we are called to be there, not here. We are living in a hope that is there. I'm not living in my past. That's where in 2 Kings chapter 4, the prophet said to the woman who had the oil, her husband had died, shut the door behind you. Why? Why? For one reason, the door behind you speaks of your past. The voices of your past will not allow you to go forward. I don't know what happened in your history, but close that door behind you. I know my golden calves. I've got no right to go back to my golden calf and remember it. Because he's washed my sins as white as snow. He's rewritten my history. Oh, my Lord, man can't rewrite history. We study history. We study the failure. We study the fault. But with God, he's rewritten my history. And he says, I've justified you. I've set you apart. I've sanctified you for this day. The day of empowering you with my presence, that you will become my witnesses. It's, you know... It's so sad how, how Israel messed up in Exodus 32. We need to see how God had prepared them for great and mighty things. You know the story of their deliverance when they came out of Egypt. Let's have a look at Exodus, 30, Exodus chapter 12, 35 and 36. And the people of Israel did as Moses had instructed. They asked the Egyptians for clothing and articles of silver and gold. And the Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites. And they gave the Israelites whatever they asked. This alone is a message all on its own. Because God wants to bless the works of your hands. Take the wealth of the unrighteous and bring it into the righteous, into the kingdom. And we need to see why the Lord wants to do this. Not so that you can build up your 401k, that you can build up your pension, that you can have a nice fancy house. But that the Lord will equip you for one thing. Widows. Orphans and refugees. That's the kingdom of God. So they stripped the Egyptians of all their wealth. My friend, be careful. Please hear me. I woke up, I woke up with, with a fear and saying, Lord, how do I bring this to the guys? Be careful that your blessing does not become your curse. Be careful your blessing does not become your curse. I know that my blessing is the gift that the Father has given to me. And my gift, my very prophetic gift, came to a point where it was my golden calf. And I had a vision one day, and I, let's hold on to that. Let's have a look at Exodus chapter 32, verse 3. Filled with the Spirit of God. Hang on, is that it? Oh, yes, Exodus 32, verse 3. That was the wrong scripture. Okay. Well, the people took the golden rings that they had brought to Aaron, and they had taken them out their ears. Sorry, I got carried away for a minute. Quite excited. 
Oh my gosh, how did I do that? Our scripts, Mr. Scripture, wonderful. But I wanted to say that, that the very goal that, that they had used, that they had taken from the Egyptians, they had made that fashioned jewelry out of it. And this they had taken from their ears, unclipped it, taken it off their ears, and brought it to Aaron, who fashioned it to make a calf. Now listen to this. A previous scripture in 31, I think it is. Let me just check that out. I think it is in 31. The Lord, the Lord, yes, 31, the very beginning. Let's have a look at, just have a look at 31 verse 3, please, if you can go back one chapter. That's it. I have filled him, it's speaking of a particular man, I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. I want you to repeat after me, the Lord has anointed me and blessed my hands for works of service. That's what that scripture is saying. The Lord had anointed this guy, filled him with his Holy Spirit, so that he could be a specialist designer for works of service. And God has given you great talents, be it if you're a plumber or an educator or a doctor or a lawyer, whatever your vocation in life. The Lord has anointed you with this talent. But be careful your talent doesn't become your golden calf. Because as soon as Moses had gone up the mountain, a group of the people in Israel had risen up with bitterness, anger in their heart, or whatever, for whatever reason, and they called on Aaron to fashion a golden calf for them. And Aaron went and fashioned a golden calf. And he re they really enjoyed what he had made. It must have been wow. And we know the story if you read it. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, Your people that you brought out of Israel, they have messed up. Moses has got the tablets that God had written with his own finger. Comes down the mountain, sees this, throws down, shatters those tablets, goes back up the mountain and says, hey, no, 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 hey, God, your people. <laughs> and it's almost like, wow. How, what brought Moses to this place? We could have this personal debate with God. Almost an argument. Hey God, it's not my people, it's your people. I want to tell you what brings you to that point. Not having, not holding hands in church. Okay, Paddy and Carl, I know that you've got your arm around your wife, but let me keep it there, brother. But let me tell you something. No babies will be born with your arm around her. If you want to get intimate and make a baby, you need to go to a quiet place and get intimate. I want to tell you something. Babies are not conceived in church. Babies are conceived in a quiet place. And we think that we can, we can romance and fall in love with God and become wowed with God in a public place. God is more concerned about your private life than your public life. God is really looking at your heart and the golden calf in your own heart than the golden calf there in public. I know the Lord's speaking to some people here today. And you're saying, Mark, this is like a little bit sharp. It's too close to the bone. Well, I would rather have the fire that I create deal with my golden calf than have the one who John speaks about also in the, in the book of Revelation. The one who's coming with a consuming fire in his eyes to deal with the calf in my heart at a later stage. But picking, picking up with John, different John here, John the Baptist. No, same John. Matthew chapter 3. Pick that up for me quickly, please. I baptize you with water. I'm oh, sorry. I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming who is greater than me. So much greater that I'm not worthy to be his slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I'm saying, Lord God, let your consuming fire come upon me and deal with the secret golden calves in my own heart. I need you, Father, to come and purify me. I want to walk down the street 
And when I walk down the street and I walk past places of ill repute, I want the powers of darkness to fall back. I don't want to walk into a room and have the enemy say to me, Peter, I know, John, I know, Paul, I know, but who are you? I want to walk into a place where people say, what perfume are you wearing? And I can say it's the perfume of the Holy Spirit. Who have you hung out with? My friend Jesus. I want people to see the presence of God. I don't want to walk around like a little Jehovah Witness in a tag or a Mormon saying, I'm Brother Mark. Oh, Lord God. I want to be baptized with fire again. My friends, I'm speaking to you. Let the consuming fire, let's learn. There's so much I could pick up in Exodus 32. On doing an exegesis and a whole study on this. And the Lord said to me, pick up on verse 20. Pick up on verse 20. Because there's golden, there's golden calves that need to be consumed by the fire. And you need to be the sheriff of your own heart. You need to come before the Father and say, Lord... Help me to eradicate the things that are not pleasing to you. Help me, Lord God, to deal with the issues in my life which are not righteous and holy before you. I want to tell you how you can do this. I want to tell you how you can get the fire of God in your life. You know, we can, we can make our hands nice and squeaky clean, but our hearts can be defiled by sin. I've been there. I've been there, and I haven't gone out and been unfaithful to Karen. I never went out and, and did a, some act, oh, but I was there in my heart. You know, when you go to Korea 92 times and you're by yourself, let me tell you, awesome, I've preached in the world's biggest churches, Yonki Cho's church, 70,000 people in a meeting, nine meetings a day. I've been in all those big things. I've done it. And I've been in the little churches that don't have money that put you in a, a little hotel, not even a hotel, but a pay-by-the-hour love motel. It's like when you walk in there, you're like, Kiri and you're laying your hands even on the toilet. I don't, want to sit, I don't want to sit on the toilet without praying over it first because I don't know what was there. I walked into this one hotel. I know you think it's funny. I'm not joking. I walked into this hotel. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. There were no other hotels in the town. And I had no... I, I walked in there and I pulled the sheets back and I just pulled them back up again because there were hairs, chest hairs and that on the bed. And I was like... So I thought, it's either sleep on that or sleep on the hard floor. So I took all my dirty clothing from my suitcase, packed it out over the bed, and then I was able to sleep on my dirty clothing. But you don't just do that. Then you clean the house out first. And I slept like a baby. When that happens, the first thing I do, when I walk into a place, the first thing I do, even today, during the worship, three times I was communicating with my wife, texting her, hey, darling, this worship is awesome. Hey, darling, two minutes and I'm going to minister. She writes back, little heart, I'm praying for you right now. You know what I do to protect myself? I become the sheriff of my own heart and I build up a wall around myself so that I will not allow myself to get into that compromising situation. And oh, my hat, has it been there? But I'll tell you how you overcome this, my friends. Father God is not here right now. He's not here. We need to know that. He's seated on his throne in the sides of the north. We know that. Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, he's not here right now. He's kneeling at the right hand of the Father, praying that you will be an overcomer. Overcoming what? He's not praying for the sinner. He's praying for you. Overcoming the trials and the tribulations in this life. And when Jesus left, he said, My Father will send the Holy Spirit the Comforter. Which I want to, if you can open up Acts 1 8, please. And we all know the scripture. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When I met Karen and I got married, 
I couldn't, I cannot, I cannot stop bragging on my wife. I cannot. Why not? Because she's the love of my life. And the more I brag about her, and the more I talk about her, and the more like wowed I'm out, I am over that. Do you know what happens? The more wowed the whole thing becomes for me. I want to tell you something. I cannot stop. I cannot stop speaking about my passion and my intimacy and the relationship and the love affair that I have with my dad. And this has been empowered to me through the Holy Spirit. And you know, you know where it comes strongest is when I'm alone by myself and I'm not pinky promising, holding hands and singing Kumbaya in church. But when I'm by myself in a quiet place, drawn aside, and I lift up holy hands to the Lord, and I sing, holy, 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 are you Lord God Almighty. And bam, the Holy Spirit comes down and whacks me and just gives me this energy shot of love. And I'm like, gosh, I've hit it again with you, Lord Jesus. And I get up and I go out of that place and I'm empowered to go into all the world to preach the gospel of Jesus. My friends, if you've got golden calves in your life, these things will distract you. They will hold you back. And you'll say, Mark, I'm really dealing with every golden calf. What is the greatest golden calf? What is the greatest golden calf that's a distraction to mankind? I believe there's two of these. Two of theirs. One is worship and the other is money. You see, the gift of God is without repentance. Am I correct on that? When God created the angelic hosts, that was long before he created the planets and the solar system. He created Michael, Lucifer, and Gabriel. And he imparted to, Ga to Lucifer two gifts. One of them was worship and the other one was wealth. And when Lucifer fell, he never took them back. So today we can hear great mus musicians singing, why does the devil have all the good music? And really, the devil's got some great music out there. And if you look at the wealth and the system of the world, it's all about money, honey. And we come to church and we sing glorious songs like Jehovah Jireh. You know that song? Yeah. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, the credit card sufficient for me. And we go glory, hallelujah. Let's, let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't smell too good. Hallelujah. And we're totally disengaged. That's what the devil wants to do. The devil, the devil has only got two things that he wants to distract you from, and they're golden calves. It's a spirit of mammon, and it's to distract you from worship. I've done it, my friends. I've done it. I've done it. I've been walking with my wife, holding her hand, walking down the street, and a gorgeous woman, and I, my head goes, my wife goes, hey. And I like, yeah, 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 yeah. Focus, Mark. My wife says to me, Mark, I'm talking to you, but you're not here. Sorry, darling. Yes, I am here. She says, no, there's a golden calf. You disengaged. Come back. And the Lord says, Mark, I want to deal with you and the issues of your heart. And I said, Lord, you've got my heart. And the Lord says, no, I don't have your heart because you're still holding on to the money. And I went like, huh? The Lord said to me, if I strip you of everything, if I strip you of everything, will you still love me? Only you can answer that. That's not what the Lord's put on you. That's what the Lord put on me. And I'm sharing with you what the Lord put on me. And the Lord said, Mark, I want you to go and crush to powder and burn it with fire, every golden calf in your life, so that I can come and empower you with my spirit and set you apart for works of service to go to the ends of the earth. That's who we are called to be. Let's close our eyes, guys. Father, I ask you right now in Jesus' name for your anointing, for your presence. Father, I thank you that we can be the sheriff of, of our own soul. 
I thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is the convictor of sin and unrighteousness. I thank you, Lord God, that is your presence which sets us free. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you will come right now. You will come in the power, the convicting, ever love, filling grace of the Holy Spirit and touch people here today. Father, I don't know what it is, but you know the golden calves in the people's life. If there's a golden calf, Lord God, let us rise up and crush these things to powder. Let us burn it with fire. Come, Holy Spirit. Come upon me. Anoint me, baptize me, set me apart for works of service so that I can go to the ends of the earth. Just keep on playing, my brother. Guys, you please open your eyes. I know, I have no doubt in my heart that the Lord, that the Lord has given me this word. And I really want to thank you, Pastor Ted, for, for telling me. I labored over this. I like you can't believe. You know, I don't I don't I generally don't labor over a word like I did this one. He told me chapter Exodus 32, and I went like, oh help me, Jesus. I'm being punished for something. Talk to me, God. I read it maybe 20 times just to find out what is the word that the Lord wants me to bring through that. And the Lord says, Mark, I want you to deal with the golden calf. But the Lord's speaking to me deeper about this. There are people here, it's not about the golden calf because that is easy. It's the blood of Jesus that sets you free. Amen, finished, move on. Much more. It's the fire of the Holy Spirit, the power and the anointing and the presence of God through the Holy Spirit to come and touch you, equip you, and send you out. And sending you out doesn't mean you've got to go and become a little missionary in Africa, but it's right where you are. Having the anointing of God upon you in such a dynamic that when you walk into the office, people can smell the perfume on you. And they will say, I want what you've got. My friends, you know, you know your heart. If you're saying, Mark, I love Jesus, but I, but I don't have, I don't have, I, I just don't have it. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Listen, I can't give it. It's the Father who gives good gifts. I'm not the, I'm not the giver of the good gift. It's the Father who comes and baptizes us again and again and again. And if you say, Mark, I really need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in my life, I'm going to ask you to stand up. It's not everybody. You might say, Mark, I'm flowing, I'm cooking, I'm boiling, I'm bubbling, I'm on fire. I'm like a volcano for Jesus. Well, cool, sit, chill. Pray with me on this. But if you're saying, Mark, I know I'm supposed to be a volcano, but, but you know what? I've got so many distractions in my life. Hey, guys, this is not the altar call. This is to equip you. Equip you so that you can go out empowered. And you might say, well, you know, like, listen, I'd rather stand up and hear than, uh, than get embarrassed. The best place, thank you, sir. The best place to stand up is right here, right now. Because I believe God's calling people to stand up in Walmart, stand up at CVS, stand up in Walgreens, go to the gasoline station and say, the Lord loves you. And you will see people drop to their knees because the presence of God on you will convict them from sin. I don't want to preach like a little Jehovah Witness. I just want to walk around with the power of God on me and the presence of the Lord. He sets people free. That God is going to touch your blood and bring healing. So a woman stands up and she comes to the front. And I got a prophetic word and I gave her the word. And I said to her, the Lord's going to change your blood type. Now, medically, that's impossible. Okay? This lady goes away. Three, we were staying at the pastor's house. Three days later, the same lady comes back with two doctor's certificates from the blood lab, from the laboratories. Her blood was, oh, I forget, A positive. She was HIV positive. She comes back with a new certificate, B negative, HIV negative. That was, the, that was the king of Swaziland's sister. And I can tell you story after story after story like this. 
I know that I know that I know I serve a risen Savior. I know this, that he has a plan and a destiny for you and me. And his plan and destiny for you and me is to bring the plans of God to pass in our life. And he who began a good work in you, he is faithful to complete it. But you can obstruct it. And you can obstruct it with that golden calf. So eradicate those golden calves. Become an extravagant lover. Extravagant. That no gift is ever good enough. Ever good enough. Extravagantly worship. I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to let go until you touch me. Your next message that you're going to preach is Exodus 33. It's like, wow. I will not let go, Lord God, until you touch me. And there's people here that really need a touch from God, maybe in your body physically. Is anyone sick in this place? You need some healing if you can stand up for me? Can you stand up? Okay, you sick? Now, this is the way I do it. I don't know if it's okay to do it like this in your church. But I don't believe in one man show stuff. I believe in the body of Christ. And he has anointed us with gifts. So this is what we're going to do. If you can just stand up around the person and lay hands on them, please. And we're going to just do this quietly. Just pray softly. Okay. So, Father God, sickness is not from you. Sickness is not from you. There is not one serious, there's not one scripture, Lord God, where you come and bring sickness on the people. I don't, Lord God, I thank you. I thank you, Father, as your children, we are protected, we are hemmed in, we are surrounded by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this dis-ease will not come upon me. I rebuke the works of darkness that attack our flesh. Father, we thank you that Jesus is the healer. And when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, when we walk through diseases, it is for your glory that we will be healed so you and may be lifted up. So, Father, right now we speak healing in Jesus' name. I rebuke, I repudiate, and I command every disease to fall off this body, to leave this body in Jesus' name. We break its power from arthritis to ulcers to migraine headaches. Lord God, I come against cancer. It has no authority. We rebuke it. We repudiate it. We speak against it. We nullify the power of disease and sickness in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Father God, that our bodies will be whole, healed, and well. Father, I thank you that I will not live until I'm 70, but I will live until I'm 100. I thank you, Lord God, that I will have a healthy body, I will have a healthy mind, and I will have a healthy soul. Lord God, my mind, my will, and my emotions will be strong. And there's people sitting here, Lord God, who have, them, have had their souls hurt. Lord God, I pray for healing, even on the inner man right now, as we're laying hands on each other. We speak life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to deal with two more things quickly. I want to touch the golden calf called the spirit of mammon, the holy cow. And I was just about to say hell. Hell, it's a holy cow. I don't know if hell, hell is a bad word. I, I went down to Oki land south, and I said, oh, hell, hell, the holy cow. And I was told, please don't talk like that. But it, it's real, you know? It's real. Listen to me. A man cannot serve two masters. Am I right? Yeah. There are two masters. The one master is the spirit of mammon, and the other master is Yahweh. And he will provide abundantly. He is your provider. There's nothing wrong with us making a contract. You're giving me some money. I'm taking your money, investing your money, and making money on your money. Or if I borrow from you, I pay back from you. Contract for my wealth. But debt, D-E-B-T, is when I, when I intentionally get a second credit card to pay my first credit card, but I know that I won't be able to pay the first one, so I get a third one to pay the second one. That's not righteous before the Lord. 
And that's serving two masters. And I believe God wants to break off a spirit of debt. Let me tell you something. What is, what is the thing that captures people and brings them into debt? And I don't have enough time. Please go onto my website. I've got a drop down on my teachings on blessings and curses regarding money. And one of the things is the desire of the eyes. Never ever satisfied. My, car's, my car is two years old. I need an upgrade. You've got 21 pairs of shoes in your cupboard and you need another pair. You've only got two feet on your body. <laughs> you don't need that. It's called, it's called lust. It's called being taken in by the spirit of advertising. It's being sucked into the spirit of mammon. And I believe that, that God wants to set us free from the control of a spirit of mammon. And there are people sitting here today that are crippled, nose high, in debt. And you can't get rid of it. Why? Because you're feeding the monster. You've got to crush that golden calf yourself. I had to. I don't have enough time to tell you the story, but we had, I had five credit cards and I prayed and God said to me, get forgiveness. Yes, my son sitting here. So how did I get forgiveness? I went to my bank manager. I said, forgive me. They said, go to a church. I said, no, 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 just, just forgive me. I promise I'll pay it. Went to my wife. I said, forgive me because I've messed up on our inheritances and our destiny. I went to my son. I went to my two daughters. My younger daughter, Joel's twin sister, what do I have to forgive you for? Why did you do it? It's like Joel was like, no stress, Dad, I forgive you. A short while later, somebody came to us and gave us a brand new speedboat as a love gift. As it, I mean, it was like, wow. We had it a year. We sold it. I had to get permission from Joel to sell it. Why? Because Joel had the faith to pray for a boat. He prayed for a boat. He said, he came to me one day, as soon as I had confessed my sin of allowing my family to get into debt, Joel came to me and said, Dad, won't you buy us a boat? I said, like, hello, boy. How? So we went to a school, Fate, you know, where they sell things and buy things to make money for us. And there was a boat over there for sale. And I said, Joel, get into the boat and pray and ask God for one. A week later, he was, we were given a boat. So I couldn't sell it, because it's not mine, really. So I had to ask my son if I can sell it. How old were you then? 10. 11 years old. As dad, I went to my son and I asked him if I could sell my asset, because he had the faith to get the asset. And he said, yes, dad, you can sell it. I sold it and I paid off all my credit, five credit cards, I paid it off. I want to tell you something. The quickest way to break free from habitual sin like debt, is seek forgiveness. And as you confess your faults one to another, you will see the power of forgiveness and healing come to you and you'll walk free from debt. So if there's people, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but if you know a spirit of debt has come against you, apply this, Lord God, I ask you to forgive me. Then cut up your credit card and don't go buy another pair of shoes because you've got 21 in your cupboard anyway. Maybe give 20 away. You say, who wants dirty shoes? Put them in the offering. God doesn't want your money. God wants your heart. Now, a second thing in this, with this, I would like to finish up. There's a tack on marriages in this church. There's an attack on marriages in this church. Let me tell you, I'm married 36 years. Bliss, amazing. Oh, but hell, have we had attack. There have been waves, tsunamis, the water's calm, and all of a sudden this wave comes in boom, to wipe out my marriage. And I look at my wife and it's like, there's nothing wrong with us. We still love each other. Oh, but boom, take this back. Where did that come from? It was just an attack. And you know when for me, you know when it happens? Just before I go in ministry or after ministry. Just before God wants to do something big. The enemy comes in to attack us, to divide us, to split us. And my wife and I are very sharp. Quickly, we see it, we repent to each other. 
And I go, darling, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. And she says, no, no, no. You forgive me. And we start arguing about who forgives each other. It's like, come on, you know what I'm talking about. There's people sitting here that have it a, just an onslaught of attack, of attack. And you're doing the chemotherapy thing, you know, like a breaking of marriage is like cancer in your body. So you go for marriage counseling and it's not working. And you walk away from there and you're like smiling, but you go home and it's like, hell, I've got this bat in my bed. Listen, you might not like the way I speak. I'm sorry, I'm a South African. <laughs> Please just blame it on me, okay? Please don't get upset. Don't blame it on God or my Christianity and my walk. But the fact is this. If you've got an attack on your marriage, the Lord wants to set you free. I did that. I did. I prayed. I said, God, please, please, God, change my wife. God, you never heard my prayer. She's not changed. Like, you know, it's like trading a car in. It doesn't work. Until I started praying, I said, God, my wife is not the problem. Change me. Change me, Lord God. Change me. So, Father, I pray right now for the people here that are coming under attack in their marriage. Will you come and heal in Jesus' name? Touch us. Fill us. Father, according to your word, According to your word, Lord God, in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, and he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints. Lord God, I pray that today equipping will take place so that unity can be established until we are all standing in the same place where you want us to be. Father, may, may, the, may the authentic anointing that prophetic anointing of Christ the high priest come and rest mightily on St. James Church. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that people here will hear you more accurately, see you more clearly, have your aroma, your fragrance, and your presence around them. Lord, release a prophetic mantle upon this church. Lord God, not just to say, thus saith the Lord, but Father, to walk in a prophetic anointing so that the powers of darkness will fall back at the power and the sound of your name. Father, I thank you that you will raise up in this church intercessors with a prophetic anointing. Raise up watchmen, Lord God, who will stand on the wall. You got it. You got it. You know that the Lord is talking to you right now. Let me tell you something. Take it and grab it. Take it. Take impartation. It's for you. So, Lord, release, release prophetic impartation that the prophetic people of Colorado Springs will rise up and be watchmen on the walls. And they will speak the word of the Lord and push back, bringing, bringing declarations of what you have decreed, speaking proclamations of your word that you have spoken. Release your anointing. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you, my dear brother. Let's all stand up together. Close your eyes and open your hands toward heaven. And just receive in your heart. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to every one of you. May the Lord show his favor and give you his peace. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Go rejoicing, love one another.